It's a wonderful week, and I hope your Christmas is a very joyous time with the family and with friends. This morning, we're concluding our series on the light of Christmas, and uh, we're going to look at what I believe are three lights that show up in the story of the Magi, though we usually only focus on one of them. And so this morning, we're in Matthew chapter 2, and we're beginning in verse 1. It says, the, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. If you knew anything about the history of this guy, uh, when he was disturbed, every, everybody else got anxious. He, he did horrible things. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen where it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Uh, information about the Magi actually requires a little bit of research. Uh, we don't know exact location that they came from or how long it took them to get there, but we do know as a group of people, they appeared about 700 years before the birth of Christ. And they were considered a priestly tribe, and they were considered wise because of their intense education. They were actually educated in science, in agriculture, in history, and in the supernatural. Apparently, across their studies, they'd come across a passage written by the prophet uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, if you're interested in finding it, chapter 24, where it indicates that there would come a great leader and that that would be signaled by an unusual star in the sky. And because they were careful observers of the night sky, they had noticed a light that was different from what they were used to seeing, and so they wondered if this could be the fulfillment of that prophecy. What's interesting is that they didn't just talk about it or think about it. They actually went to check it out for themselves, and that's what leads us to this remarkable story. Once again, I believe that this story actually reveals three lights, though we usually only focus on one. I'd like to give our attention to all three this morning, and the first one is the most obvious. It's the light from the star. It's a big part of the Christmas story. What's interesting about light from a star is how generous it is. It will shine on anyone who wants to see it. Lights don't segregate who they shine on and who they don't. It doesn't select. It's visible to everyone. The, the Magi saw what was visible to everyone. The difference was not in what they were seeing. It was in how they were responding. I'm sure you probably heard this expression, I've seen the light. When somebody says that, what does it usually mean? Well, it, it means that something in their life has significantly changed, and they've had some kind of insight or understanding that contributed towards that. Lots of people notice the light, but never see it. Lots of people observed that star in the sky, but they never pursued it. There's a great person in the Old Testament by the name of Moses, and his spiritual journey began when he was out tending sheep, and there was a bush that was burning. Not that unusual. What was unusual about this one is that it wasn't consumed by the fire. And it says that Moses decided he would turn aside and see this strange sight. He didn't just notice it. He saw it. He had to go check it out for himself. 
I think our world is filled full of spiritual clues that point to God. But that doesn't mean that they're taken seriously. People notice them. They don't really see them. I think that this story gives us some insight into God's very heart. He's not trying to hide himself. He, he wants people to find him. He wants to make himself visible. That's the Christmas story, is God becoming visible to us. People notice, but they don't always see. They don't always take what they notice seriously. What else is interesting about this star is not just the generosity of its light, but its limitations, too. Stars are not seen during the day. And if you traveled in the ancient world, you didn't do that at night. It's risky to travel at night. There's lots that you can't see. So the Magi would have to observe the night sky to get their bearings, and then they would have to set their course for the next day of travel. Once again, people didn't travel very much at night in those days. There's a second thing that can limit starlight, and that is clouds. If they drift into view, you can't see through them or past them. So the temptation in our culture today is to look at what I would like to call pocket stars today. Most of you have one. Let's see. How many have a pocket star with you today? Yeah? Just me. Okay. Well, if one of them goes off, we'll know. <laughs> the temptation is to pay more attention to these lights because they're so much bigger and so much brighter than the stars in the sky. Um, even if you go out on a a cool night like I did last night and look up into the night sky, you'll see lots of stars, but nowhere's near the number that can be seen if you're in certain locations. Quite a few years ago, we took our family on a trip out west, and we were in an elevation of about 10,000 feet, and we went outside in the night sky. There was no surrounding uh, light pollution. Everything was completely dark, and the number of stars in the sky was stunning. I had absolutely no idea. Why is it important to look at something besides pocket stars? Because we need to see something beyond the horizon of our lives. It's what helps us keep our perspective. That if all we see is the information that we can hold in our hands, we're missing out on something. Because there is more to life than just what we can see or what we have experienced. Don't get me wrong. I'm very grateful for science. I'd much rather live now than a thousand years ago. I have a sneaking suspicion I wouldn't have fared all that well a thousand years ago. But science, while it has provided a lot of information on the mechanisms of life, it has not done a great job in providing the meaning of life. We need the night sky and the stars that shine from it. They write a parable that we need to know the story of. It is good to be informed about what's going on in our world, but it is also good to be transformed. And as it turns out, our pocket stars don't do such a great job of that. Technology doesn't transform us. It's useful. It just makes our life easier. So, once again, these little pocket stars we carry around, they tend to be bright and they capture our attention. That brings me to the second point of light that shows up in this story, and that is the light of Scripture. The limitations of the star in the sky actually gave them an idea of something that would occur and a general area that it would occur, but they lacked clarity and they lacked direction. And so they made an assumption. If there's a king that's being born in Israel, then let's go to the capital city. That's where kings would be born. So they go to Jerusalem. And they're greeted by the resident king, who's King Herod. This tells you something about how important these individuals were. By the way, we don't know how many of them there were. I know the Christmas carol says that there were three of them, but that's just an assumption based on the fact that there were three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We actually don't know how many wise men showed up. But the fact that King Herod greeted them would allow an impromptu appointment to occur gives an indication of how significant that these individuals are. In fact, history indicates that no person could become king of Persia unless they passed the test of the Magi. They would instruct them and teach them and test them. And then the, the Magi were actually the ones that would place the crown on the head, acknowledging to everyone, this person has passed the test. They were literally kingmakers. 
Now you can see why Herod is so concerned. Herod calls for another group of people, people who are considered experts in Scripture, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he wants to know, does Scripture weigh in on the location of the birth of this, this new king? And they said, yes, there's a prophet. His name is Micah. If you're, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you can find him there. And in chapter 5, it's the reference that, is, that we uh, looked at and quoted earlier in, when we were reading out of Matthew 2. And it said that there would come a great leader and that he would come out of Bethlehem. And so then Herod arranges for a secret meeting with the Magi after he spoke with those who were experts in Scripture. And he asked them very specific questions about when the star first appeared. And then he gave them instructions. Go and make a very diligent search. Be very careful. Leave no stone unturned. Find this child. And then as soon as you find him, come back and report to me. And then he said this, so I can worship him too. Herod had no intention of worshiping the child. Herod had every intention of eliminating any threat to his throne. And what he was willing to do to keep that is terrifying. And so scripture gave specific instruction and direction. The light of the star was limited, but scripture provided clarity and direction. It's astonishing to me how many people can assume in our current culture that scripture isn't necessary. It's actually quite outdated. That as long as we have a, a general orientation to something beyond the horizon in our experiences, somehow we will find our way. And scripture reveals something quite different. And this story tells us something quite different. Jesus actually said this in John chapter 5. He said, the scriptures are what actually testify of me. The absence of scripture, we don't really understand who Jesus is or why he come or what he is doing in our world. Well, don't get me wrong. There's no shortage of opinions about Jesus. By the way, most people, even people who don't accept him as the Son of God, have a reasonably good opinion about Jesus. And they'll say things like, well, I like his teachings. I just don't like the people who follow him. Yeah. Which proves they actually haven't read his teachings. Because there's some very troubling things that Jesus says. He gets under the skin of a culture that pretends as though everything can be handled and managed by what we have experienced and what we know. We forget that Jesus was crucified, and that wasn't an accident. There were people who didn't like the things he said, and they went after him. Psalm 119, 105 says this, this way, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. It's why we take the study and the teaching of Scripture so seriously here. Our world doesn't just need my opinion about spiritual things. That's not going to help anyone. But if we can begin to search into the Scriptures, somehow the layers that cover us and bring confusion and cloud our capacity to see clearly, they begin to be lifted off of us as we search through the Scriptures. And they lead us to Jesus. And these, these wise men, that's where they wind up. They find the Christ child. And when they get there, the Bible tells us that they worshiped. And in case you're wondering what that looked like, they did two things. The first is it tells us that they bowed down. Not a very American concept of worship. And they gave gifts. This is what's really interesting to me, is that worship is not invisible. That when a person worships, there's something that's obvious about it. I know our culture says, well, you know, if I'm in a place where worshiping is happening, that counts. I, it's, it's internal. I'm not one of those extroverted people who, who raise their hands or lift their voice. No, no, no. Worship is not invisible. It requires something of us. And when we engage in worship, it unlocks a kind of generosity in us. So they open their gifts and they present them. And and, and that leads us to the third light, which is the most unusual and the least talked about light in this story. And that's the light that comes from a dream. After they'd found the Christ child, we know it's nighttime at this point because they saw the star and they were overjoyed to see it again. And then it tells us that in a dream, so that means that they, they, they laid down, they, they found a place where they could spend the night. And uh, I'm told that everybody dreams, just not 
Every, not everyone remembers their dreams. So let me just run a little poll here this morning. How many dream and you're aware of it? You remember your dreams? How many, not so much, you don't remember? Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I believe that the, these images and ideas and emotions and sensations, they all come to us and they come to us uh, without our effort. We're, we're not trying to bring them to our attention. Uh, psychology tells us that often we dream when we're confused about something or we're, we're trying to work through something. Something seems difficult in our lives and our subconscious is trying to make sense of it. The point kind of is, is that you don't really control your dreams. I, I just dreamt the other night that someone was trying to kill me. That's not a, a dream I would select. In fact, quite a few years ago, I dreamt I died every night, three nights in a row. <laughs> I know, makes you anxious about going to sleep the fourth night. And, uh, and by the way, the way I died the first night really ticked me off. I was not happy about that at all. I think it would be really unwise to assume that all dreams are some kind of a divine message. The truth is, is that sometimes we dream just because of something we ate or something that's eating us. That can weigh in. But it does bring us to a point that I think is interesting to think about, maybe pause in. It would be easy to assume that, the only, that, that only when we have intellectual, intentional effort that we're capable of gaining a spiritual insight, that when we're using our mind at its capacity, when we're focused and we're working on something, that's how we gain spiritual insight. And don't get me wrong, I think that we're supposed to use our minds. I think we should bring all the intellectual powers we're capable of to search deeply into Scripture. But I also think that it's entirely possible that God is not limited to our intellectual prowess. That even when we're not trying, he's able to get a message through to us. And God sent a message to these magi. And the message was one of warning. And the warning was, you're not to go home the way you came. That you are to avoid Herod. Now, this sounds easy, but it's not. In the ancient world, changing your routes would be a very difficult thing to accommodate, and there's reasons for that. First of all, in the ancient world, they didn't have a bunch of rest stops and truck stops where they could stop and, and get a lot of things. You had, to, you had to know how much you could carry and how long you could go before you had to resupply. And you had to travel on well-traveled routes because that's where safety and protection was most likely to be provided. If you went on routes you didn't know, you might run out of supplies or you might run into trouble, and there was no way to know. I mean, once again, our little pocket squares kind of get us where we need to go. Mine tells me what directions to take all the time. And then if I miss a turn, it recalculates. That's what it says, recalculating. One day I caused it to recalculate so many times I thought I heard it sigh. <sighs> recalculating. So it wasn't an easy decision for them to make, but they did it. They changed the routes. Some people misread this text, and they assume that what it's teaching is that real faith is about taking real risks. In fact, that's how they define faith. Somehow the, the spiritual life is about digging holes and letting God get you out of them. This story is not about creating risks. The story is about being obedient. And that's what faith really is. Don't get me wrong. That's not without risk sometimes. There are dreams, unbeckoned imaginings that come into our minds and they could provide insight. The Magi didn't refuse to move until they had a dream. They had a plan. They were going to go back home. They were stopping by Jerusalem. They would report to Herod. They would return to their country by the same way they came. But something about this dream was extraordinary, and they did not want to ignore it. What might you be willing to take a different approach in if you were warned in a dream? Dreams aren't meant to paralyze us, but they could lead us to prayer. Dreams could lead us to try a different approach. Dreams could even lead us to try again after we have decided that we will give up. The interior light of God's spirit can help motivate us to move when we'd rather stay. 
or to try a different approach when we'd rather use the one that we've been using all along. Once again, this dream didn't paralyze them. It informed them, provided insight. God is very generous. He sheds light to all. And God is far more specific than our culture is comfortable with. He will, has come to direct and redirect our lives. In fact, in Proverbs 3, if you've been around church world very long, you've probably heard this passage. It's very famous. We teach it to children very early in their lives. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Wise people don't just notice. They seek. Wise people don't just form opinions. They search scriptures. Wise people don't assume that God can only speak when they're focused and paying attention. They're open to his divine interruptions. There's light that God intends for us to see. And it makes all the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. It's entirely possible that you are here this morning and more or less as a favor to a family member or a friend and you really haven't bought into much of the idea that there's, beyond, there's more to life than what you have seen or experienced. That there's something more than what you understand. And I really would like to challenge that thinking for you this morning. You can live your entire life guided by pocket stars, but in my experience, we don't manage that very well. Somehow we know we were made for more than just directions and instructions. Just keeping up with what's going on right here, right now. That beyond the horizon, beyond our sight, is something very real, and it calls to us. And maybe that's something to start thinking about. Or maybe you have a general sense that there are probably things that are real and beyond my knowing. And you've kind of discounted the possibility of Scripture because it seems out of touch with culture. And let me tell you something. It is out of touch with culture. As it turns out, God doesn't think the same way about things that we do. So before you're too harsh and judgmental about God's approach, how is the world actually doing? And then lastly, is there any room, any space, any opportunity in your life for a divine interruption? Would you actually consider a different approach or trying again based on an internal prompting where a light shines not nearly as bright as the screen in your pocket or the one on your wall, but yet it calls you to something quite different. In fact, it calls you to something more. Maybe it's telling you, don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe the way you've been going isn't working, but that's, that's not the only way. There's more. There is him. God has become visible. And we can notice or we can see. So, Father, help us today. We don't just want to casually notice we want to seek. We want to find. We want to become all you intend for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.